Christ. Thank you for being with us on this beautiful, I guess it's chilly outside finally after 80 degree days, right? Uh, Sunday morning in December. I'm just glad to have you all in worship and to see your faces again uh, this Sunday. Um, it's always a privilege and an honor to be able to stand up here and to, to preach the Word and work through the liturgies and as of today serve you communion. Um, but it's also a, a privilege to see your all's faces um, and I'm just so excited to be able to be here with you uh, all this day. Um, at this time there's a few announcements that I would like to share with you. If you haven't had an opportunity uh, to get uh, one of our newsletters. They were uh, put out last week. I do invite you to grab one. I think there should be some in the narthex. If there's not, we can definitely put some out I there. I didn't see any. You didn't see any? Okay, well we can make sure that we get some out there uh, this coming week. Um, but please do grab one. There's some really great information in it. Uh, Tommy does a wonderful job with it. Um, it's got all the ins and outs of what we're doing. It's got some wonderful pictures in there of some of the decorating that we did. Um, it gives the Advent reading schedule. And like I said, just a lot of information. So this tells you what's going on in the church and when it's happening. And um, So I do invite you to grab one of these. And uh, I think calendars are very handy. I definitely need one to keep me going. So I invite you to grab one of these. Um, also, an announcement that we have... Uh, it looks like uh, pecans, so pecans, pecans, however you say it. Uh, we still have those for sale. Um, those are being sold by our, our women's group. All it's we a, have left are chocolates. Okay, oh, that's, a good, okay. that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So all we have left are the chocolates. So uh, get you $13 and buy you some. And okay. it goes to a great cause, and so we want to invite you for that. Uh, also, Wednesday, December the 8th will be an e -Tricium Volunteer Day. Um, e -Tricium, if you're not aware of what e -Tricium, it is a ministry in our community that's a combined ministry. Some say it's a Methodist ministry. It is ran by a Methodist pastor. Um, but it's an opportunity to help with bill pay. And I think when volunteers come through, they sort clothes uh, that's, that's brought in, and they sort canned foods and items like that. Um, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to be in the community and to be the hands and feet of God. And so if that's something that you are interested in doing, I promise you it will bring a lot of joy to your life and open your heart up um, to the needs of our community. So again, that's December 8th, which is a Wednesday. Again, that's HICM Volunteer Day. And then it looks like December 9th is the Oxford Baptist Church Living Nativity. Now this is just something if you'd like to do. Uh, this is a drive-thru. Uh, it's the 9th through the 12th, and it starts at 6.30 and ends at 9 p.m. So you can go anytime, drive through there uh, during those times. And then please mark your calendars for Friday, December the 17th. Uh, Bethel Lutheran Church will have their Christmas cantata at 7 p.m., uh, and Donna and Ronnie Brown will be singing. So we want to definitely make sure that we're in support of our own uh, during that time. So please mark your calendars for that. Again, this is on the back of your bulletin. These are things that you can keep up with. And say happy birthday to these people um, for this month because we love them dearly. Okay, we, I'd like to invite our Advent reader up. Sizes, shapes, and fragrances that are used symbolically throughout the world for many occasions and purposes. Perhaps candles are the oldest form of decoration and tradition and are used more often at Christmas than any other time. We light the candle of the Advent wreath to symbolize the coming of Christ to give light to a world lost in darkness. The greenery on the wreath symbolizes the everlasting life found in Christ. Green is a symbol of nature, youth, and eternal life. Evergreen branches have long been associated with the continuation of life since they keep their color year-round. Bending the branches into a circle further symbolizes life without end. Last Sunday we, we lit the candle of hope, or the prophecy candle. Today, today's candle is the candle of blessing, or the candle of Bethlehem <coughs> candle. It reminds us of the fulfillment of the promise of God 
foretold by the prophets. The prophet Micah spoke these words from God. But you, O Bethlehem, though you are small, out of you will come the one who will be ruler over Israel. The prophecy, the prophecy was fulfilled when the angel announced to the shepherds, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. As you light candles in your home this Christmas season and hang greenery throughout the house, think of the many ways that you are blessed. God continues to bless His people when they seek His guidance and direction. Let us stand and sing together our call to worship on page 393, Spirit of the Living God. And as we sing, let us truly invite the Spirit of God to be with us this day. reading this morning comes from the prophet Malachi. If you don't know where Malachi is, it's the last book in the Old Testament. It's right before you turn to Matthew. So if you'd like to grab a Bible and turn to Malachi with me, uh, we'll be looking at Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Again, that's the prophet Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through Let us hear the words of God for us this day. The scripture says, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand... When he appears, for he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, and 
till they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. This time I'd like to invite up our children, our young children. Today is pop quiz day. Everybody that goes to school loves pop quizzes. I hated them. Because I was never ready for them, right? The teacher always went. Who, who all here are teachers or have been teachers uh, here in our congregation? We've got a lot of them. You guys know what you do. You wait till we get in the classroom and nobody's studying. It's probably usually on like a Monday or a Tuesday and you say, pop quiz. Did you read over the weekend? No, I didn't read over the weekend. <laughs> hey, but you guys need to read over the weekend because it's going to happen. You've got to learn uh, these things that the teachers are giving us. Uh, but I didn't like pop quizzes, uh, and I figured because I didn't like them, I'm going to make you guys go through them because I have to. That's just kind of how the world works, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so who can tell me? Actually, first, before we start that, did everybody have a good week this week? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any fun at the forum? <clears throat> You have fun. Well, that's all that matters, right? That you have fun. All right. Now, I asked you guys last week about your Christmas list. Did they grow any? Did you have anything else on this Christmas list? You did. Now, you guys weren't here last week, so you tell me what's on your Christmas list. Top three items. Art supplies. Art supplies. That's a good one. Clothes. Clothes. Okay. And toys. Okay, you got some. Doesn't matter what kind of toy it is. You're going to love it either way, aren't you? That's good spirit right there. Stitch. Like Lilo and Stitch. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's cool. I like that. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else add anything to their Christmas list? What'd you add, Ames? Uh, a basketball jersey. A basketball jersey? What basketball jersey did you want? Uh, Charlotte Hornets. Right? Charlotte Hornets. There you go. Local boy. That's all right. There you go. Anybody else? I know we had some boots. Do you have anything else? Got your fishing pole on there? Maybe a new reel, hunting rifle? Yeah, those would be nice, wouldn't they? All right. All right, I, was gonna, I told you I was going to ask you about that. All right, pop quiz. Who can tell me who John the Baptist is? Um, Jesus' cousin. Jesus' cousin, all right. What did John the Baptist do? All right, now look, don't let her answer all for you guys. Now, I see how... Look at that. Somebody's been doing some Bible drills. <laughs> See, I was going to say congregation don't help them out, but they don't need your help. <laughs> right? What, what's a fun fact about John the Baptist? Um, his mother was, oh, um, his mother was, what's her name? I know her name. Anybody else can help? Elizabeth. Oh, looky here. <laughs> Elizabeth. There we go. Now, here's going to be the tricky question. What, what was uh, John the Baptist's father's name? Oh, I saw it written down in one of our Sunday school rooms. Zachariah. Yeah. All right, that's good. Okay, what's something weird about John the Baptist? Oh, I think I'm standing here. What's something weird about John the Baptist? Something different. You guys want to phone a friend? Anybody want to call out to the congregation? All right, we're going to phone a friend. Anybody from the congregation? What was something? You got to take her. Oh, wait a minute. He lived in the woods. He lived in the woods. That's a good start. Did he eat anything weird? Hey, Bubby. <laughs> you guys want to phone a friend still? He wore sackcloth clothing. Made his own clothing. Made his own clothing. Yeah. Um, no. He hunted for his own food. Okay. Yeah, what did he eat? Um, Two things. One of them you're going to like, the other one you're going to think is disgusting. <laughs> Not snake. Oh. How about honey? Do you guys like honey? Yeah, I love honey. Yeah, he liked honey too. The other one's a bug. <laughs> a worm. No, not a worm, not a worm. <laughs> All right, let's ask the congregation. Locust. What? Locust. Hey, 
That's what I'm going to get you guys for Christmas, some honey and locusts. Just <laughs> <laughs> think about that. How thoughtful. You wouldn't eat that? <laughs> no. It might taste good. I'll eat the honey. Though. You wouldn't eat the locust? No, none of you would eat the locust. I'll set it free. You need to eat it right here. I'll set it free. You'd set it free? I yeah. Know. So he's kind of a different guy, wasn't he? Yeah. He was set apart from everyone else, right? And he did wonderful ministry. What was he doing? Who was he preparing for? Jesus. Jesus. And what, why was he preparing for Jesus? Because um, the um, Lord sent him to help Jesus on his journey. And, bat, and um, John was supposed to baptize him in the cry, and so he would be part of the Christ. And so he was prepared for life. You see, I don't even have to preach. <laughs> these, these kids know it all. I'm telling you what, you guys are doing a good job. This is an important. This is the importance of having a good children's program right here, and, and good parents that teach them these things. Sunday school, shout out. Sunday That's right. Shout out to Sunday school. You're gonna learn, right? They probably know stuff we didn't even know, don't they? That's how that works. But it's important, right? John the Baptist is paving the way for Jesus. So how can we be like John the Baptist in our lives? Right. And to always be kind to each other. Right, exactly. That's right on that. What else, Ames? You got something? Um, following him in his steps. Right, so following Jesus in his steps. What about preparing the way? Right? Who likes football here? You like football? What's a blocker do for a runner? Who can tell me? The blocker for a runner is trying to not let the runner get past them for. No, no, no. The blocker's preparing the way, right? He's pushing in defenders out of the way. He's blocking. He's trying to make a hole for that running back to shoot through so he's got space to get positive yardage, right? Yeah, so he's preparing the way. So we've got to prepare the way for the Lord, right? We've got to teach people about love and about community and the importance of Sunday school and the importance of being in church, right, and growing in Christ in our relationship. These are all very important what else is it teaching us? Why shouldn't we be like John the Baptist? Because John the Baptist says we need to eat locusts and honey and make our own clothes and let our hair be crazy. Can y'all do that? I'm not eating locusts on dress. Now you make mud pies, but you won't eat locusts? No, I won't either. You guys, are, I, they probably don't remember this. I'll, I'll end with this. You guys remember those little suckers? You could get them at like museums or science camps and they had the crickets in them. Oh, yeah. I'd never eat them. <laughs> you eat that? No. No, I see. I wouldn't eat it. I wouldn't eat it. Ames would probably eat it. I could see him eat that. All right. All right. Who wants to help me pray? All of you? That sounds good. All right. You ready to pray? All right. Here we go. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads. Say, Dear God. Dear God. Please don't make us eat locusts and honey. Please, Please don't, don't make, make us eat locusts and honey. Right. On a serious note, uh, God, please continue to guide our community. God, please continue to guide our community. Teach us about love. Teach, teach us about, about love. So that we can teach others. So that we, we can, can teach, teach others. others. Help us to prepare the way. Help, Help us to prepare the way. To shine your light. To shine your light. On others. On others. To build your kingdom. To build your kingdom. God, guide us this season. God, guide us this season. We thank you for our family. We thank you for our family. Our church family. Our church family. Our community. Our community. And all that you're doing in them. And all that you're doing in them. And we pray this in your name. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Good job, guys. Next week, it's going to be Fear Factor, and we're going to eat some locusts and honey. I know y'all want to love that. Now, congregation, you think you're getting off the hook. You guys got to participate, too. At this time, I'd like to move us into an opportunity uh, of prayer. Actually, you know what? Before I do that, I want to speak to you of how important this is. Uh, there are so many churches that I think during COVID, um, and even probably prior to COVID, uh, that have put children's ministry on the back burner. They really have. Uh, and I am just so, 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 so thrilled um, that you guys prioritize it. It's so important that our children have a space that they can and talk about God and what they've learned and share it with you all and to hear from you all. 
Um, and so I'm very, very, very proud of you all uh, in doing that ministry. Give yourselves a pat on the back. These children are wonderful, as you can see. They know what their stuff. Uh, they're Bible scholars in the making, right? Um, so, yeah, just you should be very proud of yourselves for having them this type of uh, children's ministry, and thank you for all the leaders that are participating in it. Okay, let us move to a, a time of prayer. Do we have any joys or concerns that we would like to um, add to our list? A new baby for Kyle and Amanda Watts, little boy, yesterday. That's Colin and Amanda Watts. Kyle. 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 Okay. I heard Colin. I'm sorry. Um, and I want to share, uh, Miss uh, Sherry Lawrence will uh, be having an MRI on Tuesday, so we want to make sure that we're praying for her. Those are never fun to go through. Um, and so we want to pray for her and any anxiety that she may have for that. Um, looking at getting an injection on Wednesday, and we're hoping um, that there's not going to be any cost of surgery. So we want to be praying for, for you, Ms. Sherry, um, and just making sure that you know that we are with you all the way, and then we're going to be asking for God's help during this time. So we want to continue to pray uh, for, for Sherry. I have a praise. Yes, ma'am. Um, our daughter, Amy, and her husband, Michael, have adopted their foster child, who's eight years Oh. That is awesome. So happy for you guys. So happy. And I know they'll be wonderful parents. Any other joys or concerns for the church this morning? All right. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you this day uh, that we can be in worship, and that we can be together. I thank you for all the people that are gathered in this room, all the people that uh, are tuning in through Facebook, whether it be right now or later on in the day or in the days that come. God, we're so blessed to have this opportunity uh, to come together and worship, to, to read scripture together and to uh, sing songs and, and, and to pray together, uh, to, to learn from our children God, it's just, such, it's just such a privilege and an honor to, to have this opportunity with you uh, each and every Sunday. And God, I just ask that we could continue to learn and to grow from this, uh, to grow in our faith and our relationship with you. Um, God, I ask that your spirit would fill this room today. Uh, I know that your spirit's already here with us, uh, but I just ask that you would continue to fill this room from corner to corner, that you would fill us from head to toe and really speak to our hearts uh, this second uh, Sunday of Advent. There's so much for us to learn through these scripture readings, and they're challenging, and, and they're gonna they're gonna put us on the edge of our seat, uh, and 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 really challenge us to to grow beyond what's right in front of us. Um, and so I ask that as we prepare ourselves to hear the gospel reading today, um, that we just open ourselves up to hear it and to hear the words that you have for us. That we would tune out whatever it is in our life that's uh, that's clouding our, our thoughts and, and, and clouding our ability to listen. Um, and just let us listen for your still, small voice this morning uh, in, in your scripture reading and in our time in worship. God, at this time, we'd like to pray for um, our church, for our denomination. We pray for the United Methodist Church, for all of our bishops and those that are tasked to, to do the work of, of conferencing uh, for our denomination. We pray for all of our local congregations we pray for all of uh, the folks that come out and support the church and keep it running because that's it's so important. Um, and God, we pray for our community as our churches are gathered to worship together this week. No matter what the flavor uh, of Christian that you are, uh, you bring us together each and every Sunday. And we might worship at different times, but we're still praising you. Um, so I ask that you be with all those that are worshiping you in our community um, this day. And now, God, we, uh, we come together to pray for the names that have been uh, given this day. We pray for uh, Aiden Cox, God, and ask that you would be uh, with that family. We want to continue to pray uh, for Bob Brown and, and John Gilbert. We pray for our district superintendent, David Christie, as he continues to, to lead the charge and uh, keep us all together and make sure things go right and the boat's staying afloat. 
Uh, so we want to pray for him and his family, God, and we just thank you for his ministry. We pray for Angie Robinette, for Terry Benfield, for Clyde Robinson. We continue to pray for Dave Stafford. We thank you for the recovery of Fred Travis, God, and just ask that you continue to provide healing over him um, during this journey. We pray for Phyllis Lell and Faye Rufty. We want to pray for healing over Ronnie Brown, God, and ask that you be with them uh, during this time. We pray for Vicki Rao and ask for healing over her. We continue to pray for our congregation, God, and, and just ask that you would guide us and lead us, that you would be with our leaders and, and their meetings and the work that they do, God. Um, and just let us continue to be a beacon of light on a hill, God, for this community. Um, the future is so bright for this church, and, and I'm just thrilled in all the ministries that they're doing and, and the love that they have and the commitment that they have to being your people, God. And so I just ask that you would continue to encourage them, um, to provide support to them, um, and continue to, to lift them up, God. Again, we want to pray for Ms. Sherry uh, for her upcoming MRI, God, and just ask that you'd be with her this coming Tuesday. Uh, MRIs are no fun. Uh, nobody likes being in a machine. Um, and so I just ask that you'd remove any anxiety that she has, God. Let her know that you're with her. Let her know that her church is behind her 100%. Um, and let's just ask for positive results, God. We pray for her on Wednesday as she goes for a third injection. Um, that it wouldn't be painful and that uh, it, 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 would, it would heal her and provide uh, comfort where there's discomfort. And we just ask that there's no talk of surgery um, and that we can continue to move uh, towards a natural healing God. And so we just pray over Ms. Sherry Lawrence and just ask for your healing hands to cover her uh, this day. We pray for Michelle Day. We continue to pray for Joe Parker. We pray for the Rosenwald families, God, as we... Uh, last Sunday said we were going to pray over them this week. God, I, I hope we all had an opportunity uh, to pray for these families as we prepare to give uh, gifts to them. And, and, and that's a gift to us to be able to walk alongside these families. So we pray for them, God, and ask that you would be with them where they are. We pray for C.B. Hill, for Tim Sigmund and Barry Drum. We continue to lift up Rachel Sharp. We continue to lift up Mara. We pray for Janice Robinson and Renee Waters. For Sandy Housley, we can continue to pray for Reverend Kim and his family, God, and ask that you would richly bless them, continue to cover them in your love and in your mercy. We pray for Brian Yunt. We pray for Bobby and Judy Boggs. We ask for healing um, and, and for you to be on this uh, path to recovery for uh, Bill Sis, God, and for that family. God, we ask that you would hear all of these prayers. We pray for Amanda Watts. Uh, Kyle and Amanda Watts as they welcome a new baby and how beautiful for blessing that that is. Um, we ask that you would bring good health to their, their new baby boy. We pray for Amy and Michael as they uh, have welcomed a foster child into their home, God. And I just ask that you would bless this opportunity in this ministry for Amy and Michael that's before them. Um, and how wonderful parenthood it is, God. And so I just thank you for these two and just ask that you would be with them and bless them. And now as a church family, we, uh, we come together to pray the prayer that you've so faithfully taught us to pray. Praying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'd like to uh, welcome our special music. If we could all turn our attention uh, to this wonderful opportunity.
ministry of music in Brooklyn Church. Ooh, a blessing. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. Again, if you have a Bible um, with you, uh, if not, there's a peace Bible in front of you. If you'd like to meditate on the words, it's fine too. Uh, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 79. Again, that's the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verse 68 through 79. Scripture reads, Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people, and he's redeemed them. He's raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets, from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and in righteousness. For him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. To give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet to the way of peace. My friends, this is the gospel reading for us today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray before we enter into our time together. Gracious God, I ask that you would uh, be with us in our discussion this morning of the scripture from the gospel of Luke. As we dive into this narrative, as we look into these words from uh, Zechariah as he's speaking to his newborn infant son, John, who had great things ahead of him. God, you work miracles in our lives each and every day. And I ask that as we prepare ourselves to work through this message, that you would work miracles in our lives. That you would ignite a flame in our hearts to be your hands and to be your feet, to be a difference to bring your kingdom here on earth. God, would you guide my words, let them be yours and not my own. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today marks the second Sunday of Advent. Well, what exactly does this imply? Right? How do we comprehend the text that has been read today? It's not very Christmassy, is it? Right? We're all waiting for Christmas. Everybody's got it right ahead of them. But the texts we've read in the last couple weeks, they're not very Christmassy, are they? It's not what we think about when we think about the Christmas time. What we think about the birth narrative. But here we're hearing about the birth of John, not Jesus. Huh? But it's very important. You see, these are the sorts of questions that are going to be racing through our minds when we read through these scriptures this time of year. How do we make sense of them? How is this text applicable to my life? Why is this text so serious and painstaking? Now that's the question that I ask, right? Why are these scriptures so darn hard to walk through? I'm telling you, every time we get to Advent, I see the scriptures that are ready to be that I need to preach and I need to work through and pray through, and I say to myself, "Now, how in the world am I supposed to get up there and talk about this guy eating locusts out, talking about?" People needing to repent or they're going to hell and doing all these things right before Christmas. How am I supposed to do that? They're painstaking, right? They're hard to hear because they're important for us to hear. Christmas just being a few weeks away, well, it's different, isn't it? 
It's filled with festivities and, and family, or maybe you don't like Christmas, and it's filled with angst. It's filled with busyness and joy. All of these things at the same time, right? This is what Christmas is for us. We prepare ourselves for a moment that we either anticipate or we really dread. Or maybe it's a mixture of both, like I said. This time of year will either speed by like the movement of light or it's going to linger. That's just how it works. And in the same way, Advent is here. And it's either going to be dreadful or it's going to linger. We're either going to learn something and we're going to be transformed. And we're going to learn about awaiting God and the importance of changing our faith. And gearing ourselves to turning our eyes towards God. <coughs> or we're just going to sit here and work through these painstaking lessons. And we're going to go through the motions and be where we were last year and the year before that. We either find ourselves confused by the leading up to the birth of Christ, especially when reading through all the John the Baptist passages, or we're mesmerized by the working of the Spirit at hand in our lives during the season. Again, it can either be fantastic, or it can be dreadful. I want to share with you these words from Bishop Sarah Mullally. She describes Advent in this way. In a good Advent, we should know that we're called to action. That's right. Advent is calling us to action, to reach out to the hungry, to the imprisoned, the homeless, the refugee, the naked, the sick, and all those whom Jesus longs to touch. Right? We know this from the workings of Jesus in the gospel. He longs to touch these people to bring healing, to become messengers of God's love is what she says is what a good Advent is. And she continues, so as we wait for the kingdom of justice and righteousness, we must become part of the change. You and I, we have to become part of the change. <coughs> Speaking and living justice and reflecting on God's love and God's wholeness and God's healing. That's right, because God can heal. Being the peace. This is the key thing that really spoke to me. Being the peace that we long for. To see. You see, as a people, for so long, we want to see things be done, yet we want to sit on our hands and not do them. That's just how we work in society, isn't it? We want things to be fixed. We want our political systems to be right. We want our church business to be proper. We want our communities to be the community it always should be, but we don't want to do the hard work. We want to sit on our hands. And so she reminds us, being the peace that we long to see. These faithful words are at the heart of the passages that we've read today. And we have to prepare ourselves to be the peace we long to see in our world. It's really important. Now, before we move into the gospel text, I want to talk to you about Malachi. We're not just going to leave our Old Testament lesson sitting on the side. We're going to dust it off. And we're going to talk about it. Because it's important. God's given it to us. What about Malachi? Why is he important? Well, Malachi, my Hebrew sucks, is Malach, right? I don't have the, the phlegm part of it. But it can be translated as my messenger or being a messenger of God. You see, he's a prophet, and his name says it all. He's a messenger of God. That's his job, is to speak about God, to prepare the way for God's people, Right? His purpose in writing was to address people who have returned from exile and rebuilt the temple, but whose worship life now is in a state of ruins. Have you ever read through the Old Testament? And there's a lot of places you can turn to. Actually, just thumb your finger like this, you open it up, and you're going to read something about the people of God not trusting God or having faith in Him, aren't you? And that's just how it works. There's so many scripture passages where the people of God have moved away or they've got themselves into some type of exile or they've been occupied by some foreign nation or power. Right? Are you guys following with me? This is how the Old Testament works. This is how God's people have worked all along. And now God has taken them from exile, given an opportunity to rebuild what's been broken, and their worship has fallen 
to ruins. God's given them everything that they need, but yet they've moved far away from a relationship with God. Sounds a little familiar. The prophet is speaking to a people that are far from God and have become corrupt, that are sinful. They search for meaning and, and sustenance and all these things that don't matter, right? They surround themselves with all these things that aren't going to make a difference. It's just going to keep them going through the motions. You ever felt like you've just gone through the motions? You try to find things that are going to deliver you from whatever in your life's not going right, but yet a week later you sit there and say to yourself, you know, this thing, it really just didn't deliver me. I still feel like I'm in the exact same spot. My feet are still stuck in the mud. I never really got out of it. Right? This is how life works. This is how the people of God were. The Israelites. These same people were far removed from God and they were petitioning to God. Here, here's the funny thing to me. And I think in a lot of ways we do this too. These people were so far removed from God. They didn't need God anymore. They rebuilt, rebuilt the temple. In their eyes they delivered themselves from, the, from exile and all of these things, right? Or they forgot that God delivered them from it. And here they are, these people that don't need God anymore, but yet they find themselves petitioning God with their questions and with their complaints. They don't need God, but yet they're going to speak to God. That sounds familiar to me too. Why God? This is all your fault. You're the reason we're not close to you anymore. You failed us. Right, this is what Malachi is talking about when he talks about a refiner coming in and refining the people of God and bringing them back to their state that he intends for them. They found themselves sitting in a darkened room, waiting on chartered waters. And the question they should be asking is, how can we return to God? How can we get our lives back on track? This is what we're longing for. We're not going to find it in the things of this world. Deliver us from those things. Bring us closer to you. Sadly, this isn't the question being pondered. I want to talk about dark rooms. This is going to be the theme of our conversation today is darkness. Because it's the theme in our scripture I want to talk to you about a young woman. This young woman sat in the dark with the sound of a baby crying in the back room. She was struggling with the possibility of relapsing from drug addiction. You see, from her teenage years through her mid-twenties, she had struggled with drug addiction. She had gone to many, many different rehabs. She had gone to different clinics, taken all kinds of different medications, been to every church that you could probably go through. And finally, by the help of her family and by the help of God, she was delivered from it. Now, she still had that itch for addiction, but she wasn't using. She had gotten healthy. She was married, had a baby, but she found herself this night sitting in a room in the dark. The baby's crying. Everything's falling apart around her. And in her hand, she held a card. See, her mom passed away a few years prior. But she had this card that her mom gave her. And it was a hotline number. And it says, whenever you feel like you might use again, whenever you feel like life is just so tough that you can't figure it out for yourself, that you find yourself in darkness, in the belly of a whale, call this number. Get yourself help. Don't wait till it's too late. Get yourself help. So she picked up her phone, she got the courage, and she called the number. A man answered. And they talked. Hours upon hours upon hours. She started feeling better. She could feel God moving in her life, her spirit growing. She started turning on lamps in the room and lighting candles. And her spirit was lifted. She was able to go and put the baby down and soothe the baby. Get it back to sleep. There was now peace in her home. Again, she'd been moved out of this darkness. And towards the end of their conversation, 
overcome by the experience, she asked the man, How long have you been a Christian counselor? There was silence on the phone. A few minutes later, the man responds, I have a confession to make. You dialed the wrong number. But after hearing your angst, after hearing your voice, your need, I decided to just sit and listen. To spend time with you. To walk with you and to journey with you. I hope you accept my apology, the man said. And with tears in her eyes, the woman would later respond. She knew in this moment there was still love in the world. And it was God's love. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he's prophesying. This man was a mute, by the way. Did you guys know that? Zechariah was a mute. He couldn't talk. And then his baby was born and brought into this world. And if you know anything about John the Baptist, think about Elizabeth. When Elizabeth was pregnant... What did John the Baptist do? He would jump for joy in her belly, right? So, strange things happen, right? <laughs> so, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, was a mute. And then the first words that he says, being delivered from this, is, Blessed be the Lord of God, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people. He has redeemed them. To give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. To give light. Listen to these words. He's been a mute. And the first words that he says is to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. To guide our feet in the way of peace. Amazing, right? To bring light into the darkness. To bring, bring peace where there's not peace. You see, he knew that his son John, as he was told by the angels, is to be a lamp that lights the way for Christ's coming. But he knew that the implication was for us too. That we all have a role in this thing. That it's not just John that's to pave the way, but it's us as well, right? We're awaiting God. Are we going to sit on our hands or are we going to jump for joy for the coming of the Lord? The birth of Christ, as we know, is to bring peace to his creation that now sits, listen to this, that now sits in darkness and to guide his people to peace. Jesus is the light that's being brought into the world to deliver us from our darkness. To bring peace into the world that we have created that has no peace. That is the birth narrative. That is the importance of Christmas. And that, my friends, is the message that we are to deliver to all that we come into contact with to be a lamp that lights the way of Christ's coming, because he is who brings light into the darkness to guide his people to peace. Now, I'm a church historian. I uh, spent time studying the church fathers, I feel like, my entire life now. You can ask my wife. I've got too many books that I don't know. Actually, really, she doesn't know what to do with them. I sometimes know what to do with them, uh, but really, they just collect us, I guess, at this point, uh, all over our house. But I want to talk to you about some of these church fathers, right? If I studied it, I need to talk about it. That's important. One of the church fathers, his name is Bede. That's right, B-E-D-E. -E. If you want to write it down, you can search some really good stuff. Listen to what he says about this scripture passage. He says, He found us sitting in darkness in the shadows of death, weighed down by the ancient blindness of sins and ignorance, overcome by deception and the errors of the ancient enemy. He said, God has found us 
sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. And then Cyril of Alexandria in his writing on Luke, this is what he says. Listen to this. For the world was wandering around in error. Do you ever feel like you're just wandering around, right, in our faith? He says that they're serving the creation in the place of the creator. Was darkened over by the blackness of their ignorance. Night, as it were, that had fallen upon the minds of all, permitted them not to see him who is truly and by nature God. They were wandering around in darkness. They could not see the face of God. You see, the people of Israel were wandering around in darkness. They had long expected God's deliverance would take the form of deliverance from the domination of foreign powers and armies. You see, what they expected in a Messiah was someone that was going to come on a horse bearing a sword with armor and shields that would fight for them and deliver them. Right? Because God wasn't doing it. That's not what they received, is it? They got a young boy that was born in a manger in a very dirty place family couldn't find anywhere to have a proper birth. They had no money to their name. Heck, they might as well be exiled because everybody at that time probably thought Mary had, had sex out of wedlock or she had cheated on her fiancé, Joseph. People were talking, just like we do in our communities. That's how it works. Because they couldn't accept the truth. They got a carpenter. He learned the trade of his earth father. He was a carpenter. He built things with his hands. I imagine him as being calloused. He spent time at the temple. He learned humility. He learned the importance of having true faith, of walking with God's people, of being intimate, right? Of living into our fragility. And the fact that our lives aren't infinite. They got someone that experienced emotions and shed tears like we do, and laughed and hurt and had anger, walked the same earth that we walk, worked a job, and then he was baptized in the river, and a dove descended down upon him. He started doing the ministry that this world owes him needed. Because we were too busy wandering around in darkness. He became the light in this world that we need so desperately. But that's not what God's people wanted, was it? You see, we want deliverance from the things that upset us. Right? We want our politics to be a certain way. Instead of God... Uh, doing all these things that he was doing through Jesus, they would uh, rather have him deliver them from domination of foreign powers and armies because that's all that's important. They wanted their land. But God would offer them a deliverance that would come in the way of a new exodus, a new opportunity to remove themselves from exile. The true end of God's redemption it's not a deliverance from worldly domination, but it's creating a condition in which God's people can learn to worship and serve God with whole hearts and with faithfulness. To learn to worship. To become a people that raise God up high. It's in this passage that we read of freedom. We talk about freedom. You watch our political candidates. You tell me how many times they talk about freedom. Right? We read of freedom. Freedom from an outside view. Freedom means release from the power of enemies. Right? That's what we think. But the true freedom being offered is one that brings the people of God to worship and holiness of life. 
It's an opportunity, a freedom, to get to know God more intimately. To be transformed instead of the turning of will. You see, God's telling us you don't have to wander in the darkness anymore. You can turn the lights on. You can light a lamp. You can light a candle. You can soothe the baby. Worship me, he says. Have holiness in your life. Don't go through the motions. Let me help you with that. This, folks, is what the Advent season is all about. It's realizing that we don't have to wander through darkness anymore. I'd like to close because we got to, I don't know, are we going to be, we're not going to beat the Baptist. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'd like to close. This is a wonderful book. Um, it's called My Grandfather's Blessings. She's a, um, an oncology doctor, um, and her grandfather was a rabbi. And I want to close with this uh, from her. It's called One Little Candle. Marie, a young nursing administrator from a large urban hospital on the East Coast, took part in one of these sessions. As each person seated around the uh, sand tray table placed the objects they had gathered into their section of the sand, I noticed that she had kept something back and put it beneath her chair. As the instruction is to use all the symbols you bring to the table, I had wondered about this. One by one, the group members spoke about the objects they had chosen and how each symbolized a part of what their work meant to them. Marie listened closely and seemed deeply moved by what the others were saying. And about halfway through, she began to speak about what she had put before her in the sand. When she finished, she fell silent for a few moments and then hesitantly told us that there was something she wanted to add that she did not want others to see. She asked us to close our eyes while she did this. The group of nurses and physicians, psychologists and social workers sat around the table with our eyes closed. In the silence, Marie reached under her chair for the object she had hidden. And after a few moments, she told us we could open our eyes, and we saw she had placed a slender white candle and a tall candlestick in the center of her part of the sand tray. It was unlit. Just showing it to us obviously had a deep emotional significance for her. I offered her a box of kitchen matches, and she sat holding them for a long time, unable to light the candle or even talk about it. Finally, she lit it saying in a barely audible voice that it represented her real life, her real self. It was a touching and surprisingly intimate moment, especially powerful as the candle bore a striking resemblance to her own beauty, simplicity, and purity. One at a time, others also shared their work, and then the woman seated next to Marie at the table began to speak. She too had an unlit candle in her tray. It was short and fat. She told us that it represented her dream of being a professional and working with an open heart. As she spoke, instead of lighting her candle with the matches, she picked it up, reached across the low wooden boundary between her section of the table and Marie, and she lit it from the flame of Marie's candle. And Marie burst into tears. The woman, a sophisticated psychiatrist, began to apologize, saying that she had no idea why she had not used the matches and had not meant to invade Maria's same tray. Oh no, Maria told her. It's, it's that there's so much cynicism and judgment among us that I never show anyone at work what really matters to me. Only my patients know. I'm afraid that people will laugh or they will think less of me, and so I hide myself. For me, this work is holy. It's my calling. And when you lit your candle from mine, I saw why it might be important to stop hiding. Perhaps I can find the courage to be who I really am. Perhaps there are others like you who are hiding too. There was a moment of silence, and then these two women reached for each other's hands. Today we are all gathered around the table. Some with an unlit candle in this room. Others seeking to have their candle lit by another in this community. <clears throat> this Advent season, God is calling us to reach out. So that as we await the kingdom of God, we can be part of the change in reflecting God's love, reflecting God's wholeness, and reflecting God's healing. Being the peace, my friends, that we so long to see in a dark world.
being a much needed light in the darkness. My friends, this is all said in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a response to the word, again I apologize for keeping you too long today. As a response to the word, let us re uh, come before God at the table. If you would turn in your hymnals for our liturgy of service of word and table on page 12. Ames, would you please come forward as he went out? Hey, buddy. He's going to be my, my helper today in communion. Can you say this part right here? Pass the Lord the nights to his table, all who love him do earnestly, mm -hmm. repent on their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us confess. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here are the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, singing, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died. Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the true body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever, we pray. Amen. Amen. Check it this time. Now I'm looking there. If it wasn't cut this time, it ain't gonna fall on the floor on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was cut. Look at that, but you didn't cut it all the way. Okay, that worked. On the night in which God gave himself for us, he took a loaf, probably very similar to this, and he raised it up in the air and he told his disciples, his beloved, his friends, what he considered his family. He said, My friends, this is my body 
This is my body that is to be broken for you. And you're not going to understand it right now. It's foreign to you. But soon light will come into the darkness of your mind and reveal to you what this means. And so he broke the bread and he passed it around the table. And they all took a piece of the bread and they ate of it. And then he grabbed the cup and he held it up to all of his friends, his beloved, and he said to them, my friends, this too is something you're not going to understand, but in due time you will. He said, this is my blood that's been poured out for you, and I hope that you can drink from it as often as you can. And he passed the cup around and they all drank of the cup. Friends, today God invites us to his dinner table. It's a lot like our dinner table at home. There's to be laughter and joy and love and light that fills the room. We are God's family. We're God's people. God wants us to come to the table. All are welcome. Let us start on this side as we come to the table. Ames and I are going to come down. start on this side and work our way.
response to the word this day, to an opportunity to feasting at the table, let us turn to the Apostles' Creed. This can be found on page 881 of your hymnals, or if you know it by heart, like I said, in being a good Methodist, which I'm not, uh, <laughs> you can recite it by memory. Um, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us close and sing to fill my cup, Lord, on 641. seeks to be there. He desperately seeks to be the light that fills the room. Friends, this is the message of Advent. This is what we're waiting for. To be made whole by God. My friends, take this word of hope, this light of Christ into the world. Amen. Amen.